biosynthetic pathways. Too. Yeah. So yeah, I'm we're okay. we're struggling. <laughs> Have microphone conflict tonight. <laughs> um, thank you for coming out. It's a beautiful night to see everyone. Dark in the fall, but here we are in a pleasant environment. Um, the obligate disclaimers are that. Um, one concern is that we didn't bring any Ebola virus to Corvallis to do any of this work, so there was no, no risk to Corvallis to the work. Um, and as Craig pointed out, I have a conflict of interest in that I was at Sarepta. I still consult with them, uh, particularly on the Ebola program. And I've also founded a small company called LS Pharma. Um, let's begin with just starting with the broader concept of infectious disease. Um, Personally, I think this may be one of the most important research areas to investigate, and the reason is here. If we look at every reason someone dies, uh, they're plotted on this graph here. You can see the cardiovascular disease is number one, with 16.7 million deaths in a year, uh, adding up to this 57 million people die in a year in the world. It's actually more now because this was done in 2010. But infectious disease and parasitic diseases are responsible for almost 15 million deaths. Now that's definitely an important fact, but what isn't told is that both cancer, and the malignant neoplasia, uh, some percentage of that disease is also responsible, or infectious disease cause some forms of malignant neoplasia, and infectious diseases are responsible for quite a bit of cardiovascular disease. So that if you took away those portions from these two flanking uh, areas, you would find that probably infectious disease is the number one cause of death. And um, we should spend more time worrying about it, frankly. So the idea of a pandemic, and I thought I'd bring this up, uh, Ebola has progressed from what has historically been thought of as an outbreak and after an outbreak, after enough people are involved and enough geographic region is involved, it becomes a pandemic. And Ebola is right at that transition right now. Hopefully it won't become a full-blown pandemic. But it isn't the first time the human race has seen a pandemic. You can see that the plague of Justinian killed 50% of the population of Europe. The Black Death reduced the world population from 450 million to 350 million. Smallpox uh, was responsible for reducing the population in Mexico from 20 million people to 3 million people uh, at the time the Spaniards came in. And in fact, some people think that when Cortez conquered un unbelievable odds, it was actually because the population he was fighting was dying already from smallpox. In Europe, 80% of all the children under five died from smallpox. Tuberculosis in the 1800s killed 25% of all the adults in Europe. And more recently, the 1918 Spanish flu. This is a very conservative estimate of 50 million people. Some people would say as many as 150 million died from uh, influenza. So clearly we have examples where we should pay attention to just how powerful an infectious disease could be. So I want to introduce what the Ebola virus is. And you've seen those pictures, obviously, on the news with that sort of filamentous virus structure. And I thought maybe you'd be curious to just see what it looks like if you kind of were able to zoom in uh, like this artist's rendering. And what you can see at the center is this um, single-stranded RNA loop. This is the genome of the virus. It's considered uh, a negative sense virus, that is to say that when it translates a protein, it has to make a copy of this in order to make the messenger RNA. But it is single-stranded. It has with it the polymerase complex already on the RNA, ready to replicate as it's packaged within the virus particle. There's a nucleocapsid protein that appears to wrap itself around that RNA. RNA is a very unstable molecule, and so it is protected, as it were, by the nucleocapsid protein. There's a matrix protein that fills the inside of this. The smooth structure, this viral membrane, is actually the membrane of the last cell the virus came out of. 
So the virus doesn't synthesize a membrane, it steals the membrane from the cell that it had been in. So in the case of a human, this membrane would be the membrane that is a human membrane. And finally, the glycoprotein. And the glycoprotein is very important. It is the outside protein on the virus, and it's what the immune system sees first, and this is what most of the immune drugs target. I thought I'd give you a little bit of understanding about the biochemistry of a single-stranded RNA genome. Normally, uh, DNA, which is a double-stranded structure in which the classic rules of A pairing with T or G pairing with C are observed. So it's a simple alphabet, just two sets of conditions, A, T, G, C, and the, the code is read in that manner. DNA frequently makes a messenger RNA or a uh, sense RNA, which is single-stranded, which means that each base is ready to be paired with its complementary sequence. That RNA in a cell would be translated by the ribosome into a protein. And in this case, like Ebola, uh, a virus is not an independent organism. It can't live without the cell. It steals the ribosome structure of the cell in order to make its proteins and do its business. But as it turns out, um, this virus comes into our bodies as a minus sense single-stranded RNA virus. It has to be converted to the plus sense to make the proteins. That process is one that their own enzymes are encoded by the virus, as is the ability for the plus to make a minus sense copy. And that is uh, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which normal cells do not have. So uh, this, this gives you sort of the background of the biochemistry, and we'll talk a bit more about it later. So once the virus here comes to the body, the site of entry is actually just a couple of cell types. On the one hand, a macrophage. On the other, a dendritic cell. So when we talk about how contagious Ebola virus is, we're talking about the capacity of this virus to find one of these two types of cells. The dendritic cell is important because it actually is at the early stage of presenting antigens to the immune system. And it turns out that uh, Ebola virus will not only replicate in a cell, but it actually cripples the host's ability to mount some immune responses. It's actually quite um, covert in this activity. And on the other side, the macrophage, which can be infected, is very important because it can move around the body and it can invade tissues. So essentially, once the virus gains entry into a macrophage, it becomes a passenger, and that macrophage can carry that virus to other tissues in the body, like the brain, or in one particular case, it can carry it to the testes. And that's important because the virus can live in the testes, and a route of infection can be from seminal fluids. So this is actually a potentially sexually transmitted disease. And one thing that's probably uh, one you haven't heard is that we talk about people who can go 21 days. If you don't have the virus, you're good to go. And when, when Kevin Brantley was in the hospital, they waited until 21 days. He had no virus in the blood. But unfortunately, he almost certainly still had virus in the seminal fluid. And that will persist for months. <clears throat> so once you become infected with Ebola virus, uh, the, we talked about the sites of entry and how that progresses to various tissues, but what you see is uh, the route would be very much like the flu. A surface might be covered with particles, you know, if someone sneezes or coughs, they have little droplets, those droplets carry virus. The virus is in the droplets on the surface, you touch that, and if you touch a mucous membrane like your eye, which is one of the more common routes, you can become infected. This is another uh, interesting area we'll talk a bit more about. Once those cells have been infected, uh, the virus then attacks the immune cell cells of the liver and the spleen and lymph nodes, and at this time you're starting to develop symptomology of headache, fever, sore throat, achy muscles. And one problem that we have to acknowledge is that everything does that. 
So you could have the, a cold, the flu, they all look the same at this stage of the game, which is why doctors were confused. Even in Texas, where they really had a good reason to worry about uh, Thomas Duncan, is that his symptoms look like anything. So this e Ebola protein, VP24, is one of the proteins that the virus makes that will block the immune signaling pathway, which retards the host's ability to attack the virus. Uh, the immune system that does remain actually creates an inflammatory response, and this damages the lining of blood cells, the endothelium. That damaged endothelium provides a place for platelets, which are the clotting elements in blood, to accumulate. And so we see a traumatic decrease in the number of platelets that are in the blood. This is why it's a hemorrhagic disease. We've lost the ability to coagulate our blood because there are too few platelets. And the reason isn't because the platelets were destroyed or removed. The reason is, is that the platelets are all distributed. And we do see this in many abdominal cancers. We see a phenomenon called disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, which means that all the platelets are distributed around the body and they're, not, they're bound to all the sites on the blood vessels and unable to respond in the blood itself. And finally, uh, the blood clots that we see that are along those blood vessels um, they do go to the spleen. They fill the spleen with debris, so you have a big puffed up spleen. And finally, you develop a rash on the face, neck, torso, arms. And then you have a severe diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. This can be about two and a half gallons of fluid per day that you lose. And then you develop a headache, hiccups. Hiccups, oddly enough, that's the one symptom that, you, you know, as you know, we see about 50% mortality with this virus. When the physician sees hiccups, they actually are most pessimistic. Those patients are the most likely to die if they develop hiccups. Finally, you see liver and kidney failure and death follows quite soon. So as we talk about the Ebola outbreak of 2014, it's depicted here. Um, the circle would be a little bigger today because it's been a few weeks since someone made this diagram. But the virus actually extends back to 1976 when it was first described as Ebola virus. And it was called Ebola because of the Ebola River that ran through the area where the first identification was made. And the circle size is meant to indicate how many cases. The darker inner circle are those patients who died, and the lighter one is the ones who survived. So you can see early on this was an extremely lethal virus. Then we had another small outbreak, almost completely lethal, 1995, 2000. So one trend that I think would be worth noticing here is that while this seems like a pretty big space in time when there weren't any outbreaks, they seem to be getting closer and closer together. And it is believed that at some point in time, there will always be an endemic Ebola. And I think that's one of the things when you hear on the news about the fear is that we prefer that not to happen, um, that this virus could become endemic. It'll always be around, and you'll always have to wonder about where it is. This is a curve which talks about the rate of casualties versus time. And you can see that here, uh, very low level, and it's reached this exponential growth curve. And as of a week ago, the number of cases was doubling about every 21 days, or about every three weeks. And this is the case of deaths. I wanted to include this picture here of Sheikh Kumar Khan, in part because I think when we think about these outbreaks, we, we think about all these dead people and curves and whatnot. But here's an individual. Um, he died of Ebola in July, July 29th of this year. He was a doctor who was at a clinic that was uh, designed to respond to Lassa fever. Lassa fever is another endemic virus. It's an Arena virus, uh, which is also hemorrhagic. And they realized that they had Ebola, and they, they realized that there weren't enough clinical sites to take care of Ebola patients. So they became a dedicated Ebola clinic. And he and most of the staff there have died from Ebola. Well. This raises a question if, you know, the cup is either half full or half empty. So if we think of a disease that has 50% survival or 50% case fatality ratio, 
one really key question that comes to your mind is, well, how come the 50% live? And the uh, recent paper, actually very recent, in New England Journal of Medicine addressed this question, and they found that age was a critical factor. 50% of the people uh, that died were under the age of 21, compared to 94% of those who died were greater than 45 years old. So it appears that this is a virus which would be more lethal in older people. Um, aggressive rehydration therapy is uh, very critical in the treatment of patients, and those patients who receive aggressive rehydration therapy soon have a better survival rate. Survivors generally re receive early treatment. Um, one thing that, again, isn't expressed in a lot of, of uh, news stories is that once you've developed Ebola, your immune system is unable to respond to uh, new infections. Essentially, your immune suppressed while you're devoting all the energy of the body to fight Ebola. This means that you can develop bacterial infections which are secondary. So starting broad spectrum antibiotics in these patients would improve their uh, survivability. One thing you're seeing uh, that people talk about a lot is what is called convalescent serum. And this would be a patient who would survive. They've developed the antibodies and the T cells and everything that can fight the virus. So if you can take the serum from someone who survived, which we would call the convalescent serum, and provide that to a patient who's actively infected, it should be able to fight the virus. Um, this is a bit risky to a Western culture medicine because there are a lot of things you could find in serum and you really can't, you know, HIV is a possibility, hepatitis C virus. So uh, this strategy, while uh, emergency, isn't a, a great uh, solution. Uh, survivors are generally healthy and have strong immune systems. Uh, comorbidity features are things like pregnancy, autoimmune disease, and diabetes. Malnutrition is also a factor here. And, and finally, in October 30 issue of Science, uh, looking in various mice, they crossed mice with different genetic backgrounds, 30 different crosses, and they found uh, strains of mice that were resistant to Ebola virus. They were able to link it to these two genes. So if you can overexpress these genes, you will have a better chance of survival. Another question that's come up quite a lot is how easy would it be to get Ebola virus? And there, there are sort of uh, the question about is it airborne? And the answer, uh, this was actually brought up in September by the New York Times op-ed written by the, uh, Mike Osterholm from the uh, Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. And he says, what we're afraid to say about Ebola is that it could mutate and become transmissible through the air. That would be, you know, a bad thing. Um, but the answer to that is, is that for a long time, the researchers at various military facilities uh, and in Europe at a uh, facility called Port and Down have used aerosol delivery of Ebola virus. And in this case, um, these monkeys, for example, were exposed to the virus in an aerosol and 100% of them died. So the answer is yes, <laughs> you can have an aerosol of Ebola virus and it would be contagious and it would kill you. The question then is how do we put this into perspective? And that's here. <laughs> so. There, there, there are really two fighting factions. They're, they're, we're, we're observing something very interesting in time. We're watching the Centers for Disease Control and the National Institutes of Health try to digest information and make it um, easily digested to our news media. And on the other hand, I think people are pretty sharp. I, I listened to a radio program and one of the people called in and they said, well, if it's so hard to catch Ebola, how come all the guys that work with it are wearing these respirators? And if you don't catch it by aerosol, what's going on here? And the answer was, it's true, you can catch it. Uh, but it's, the, the fact of it all is, is that if you just look at the end result, the contagious feature is asking how many people can catch the virus from an infected person? So this is taking all comers. This is taking the whole of the population and asking for every person that's infected, how many people become infected? And the answer is for Ebola, it's about 1.7. This is actually called the R sub zero factor, 
which is used in determining whether or not an outbreak is growing or not growing. If the R sub zero value is one, the virus does not expand. If it's below one, the outbreak is condensing and will quench. So as long as R sub zero is greater than one, it's an outbreak. But what's exciting here is that for all of the stability of the virus, the virus has been recently shown to last over 50 days on a various surface like a glass uh, object. The virus is still infectious for over 50 days. It could be captured by aerosol. But at the end of the day, still, it's hard for that virus to find its way into your body enough that it's initiating this infection. And that's, that's why everyone is saying it's hard to catch. This is the number. It's equivalent to hepatitis C virus. We know what that's like. We all have a lot of friends who have hepatitis C, and we kind of know it's a little bit hard to catch. On the other hand, everybody has experience with measles. Measles is very easy to catch. So for every infected person, 18 subsequent people can be infected. So to put it into perspective, this is easy. This is what they're calling hard. One other interesting thing in being a person that's worked on Ebola virus uh, since 2004 is that who wants to, who's worried about Ebola anyway? And it turns out that there really are three distinct groups. And I bring this up in part, I think the public health uh, need is obvious, right? That's what we're experiencing right now. We have an outbreak, public health. Uh, one sub part of this is, is that Ebola virus is actually killing uh, very endangered great apes of Africa. This is a culprit that's actually resulting in the future extinction of the great apes. So there's that interest. Uh, the second one of, might not be as obvious, but people who have to work in a BSL-4 laboratory or a biosafety containment laboratory um, are at risk. They're essentially taking their life in their hands. And um, my personal experience with this was that in 2004, I was working with a group at a uh, facility called USAMRID, uh, which stands for the United States Army Research Institute for Infectious Disease. <laughs> and uh, one of the researchers there went into their high containment laboratory and was infecting mice with a syringe full of Ebola virus. And as they pulled up the skin <clears throat> to inject into the skin, the mouse kicked. <laughs> and the needle went into her finger rather than into the mouse. It only takes one particle to be lethal. And she had a million particles per milliliter. So it initiated our whole program on Ebola virus, frankly. But uh, this is a uh, stakeholder in finding something that would treat Ebola because it would be a lot nicer to do those research experiments if you had a rescue pattern, something as an antidote, as it were. But finally, the Department of Defense. And this brings up a very critical point. Ebola virus is considered a weapon. And when I work with people at, at USAMRID, uh, they treat each vial that contains the virus with the same responsibility code that they would give a nuclear <coughs> missile. So it's, uh, it, it, it definitely, their sense of responsibility says, that this is a very important thing. And because they considered a weapon, um, this introduced something else. The Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty includes infections like Ebola virus. And this brings a limitation to some kinds of research. Um, it's called dual use research. And I don't know if you remember, but a couple of years ago, um, an investigator was studying influenza and he wanted to publish a paper in science and the editor wouldn't publish it. And they considered the information that the investigator wanted to say, this is how the virus has to mutate in order to become uh, adapted to humans from birds. But the concern from the editor was that this is teaching a terrorist how to make a better influenza virus that would attack people. So now there are actually committees that sit over scientific publications to determine whether or not they're trying to publish dual use research. Uh, maybe another example just to bring this home is um, the smallpox research in Australia produced a smallpox in which they spliced a gene for IL-10 into the smallpox virus. 
this would allow the smallpox virus to evade vaccination. So while the investigator felt that he was just trying to understand the scientific relationship between how IL-10 contributes to the infectivity of the virus, the dual use aspect is this is a template or a, a plan for how to make a better weapon. I thought it was obligate to at least show one slide of where we're talking about this is Western Africa. Um, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia are the key sites of infection, and the darker are the most recent um, intense sites of infection. Just a quick, obviously it's not an eye test, um, but I just wanted to point out that the outbreak actually started in December. December 2nd of 2013, uh, nine, nine deaths were reported in uh, Gukekadu, Guinea. I'm not sure I pronounced that correctly, but um, my point for bringing this up is that we're, we're now approaching a year since this outbreak started. And one of the aspects that we should keep in mind is that it really took kind of a long time from when the virus was first recognized as uh, having an outbreak to the time that we actually started to do something about it. Um, in our March of 25th, the CDC did announce that there was an outbreak. At that time, there were 86 cases with 59 deaths. Um, but finally, in, in July 26th, when um, the two doctors without borders, Kent Brantley and uh, Nancy Reitbull, were infected in, and uh, were treated, um, that's when I think it attracted our attention, and it became sort of the daily story on the news. On July 31st, the CDC raised their warning level to three, which meant they were quite concerned that this would be a global problem. And on August 7th, the World Health Organization uh, actually put out a proclamation that this is a concern of international interest. Now, on September 6th, uh, Sierra Leone did something very interesting. They were so worried um, that the culture was not letting doctors identify patients and, and separate them so that they wouldn't infect more people. And they announced that they would uh, lock down the entire nation for a weekend, which they did. And so what they were looking for, and, and, and try to put your mind in, in the mindset of the people of Sierra Leone. First of all, they have people. They're usually Caucasian in this country, generally black. So they have people that come from foreign, and they're doctors, and that whenever they take somebody away, they disappear. They're dead. They go away. So family members are taken to places where they die. The relationship between the death and the taking away is confusing. So they actually fear the medical people. Uh, and so what actually happened was while this was a very successful event, the lockdown, it resulted in nine healthcare workers being stoned to death by local people because they were very, uh, uh, to say the least, they were concerned about these healthcare workers. And so it, it speaks to the apprehension of the people who are living in this chaotic situation and their level of understanding of what's actually going on. And of course, at that time, there were 3,700 cases with 1,800 deaths. On September 16th, President Obama uh, commented that the world is looking to the United States to lead the way in the solution for this outbreak. Um, at that time, there were 5,000 cases and 2,600 deaths. Um, Obviously, on September 30th, this is when Thomas Duncan came to the United States. He didn't have a fever. He didn't have any identifying problems. And uh, so he made it through the screening process, went to Texas, and then later developed a fever and went to the hospital. And I think you know the story. Um, October 8th, he died. And then that day, we had 8,000 cases, about 3,800 deaths. On October 15th, Amber Vinson and uh, Nina Pham with the nurses who took care of Thomas Duncan, who had been found, were infected and Ebola positive. Um, they've both survived now, so that's the good news. The, all the rules were there. They were relatively young, relatively healthy, and they got health care quickly. But at that time, we had 8,900 cases with about 4,900 deaths, 4,400 deaths. As of October 29th, we had 13,000 cases and about 5,000 deaths. And the CDC actually estimates that the actual number of these two things, these events, is about 2.5 times larger than what is reported. And that's because 
there just aren't that many sites where the patients can be seen in Africa, so we assume there are a lot that are out there that we don't know about. I thought it would be worth highlighting what's happening. So this is a, a paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine on April 16th, but what I really want to highlight is, so this is actually an epidemiology study of the outbreak when it was still very early. And so each case is numbered, case six, case seven. But here, subject 14, and I highlighted it in orange because this was a healthcare worker. This person was taking care of these people. Uh, he died on um, February 10th, but he went to this doctor, subject 15, who was in a, in a larger town, uh, who took care of this patient, and this patient died on February 24th. So what's happening here is that the healthcare workers are giving it to the other healthcare workers, and the healthcare workers are bringing it home to their family. So this is a problem because in, in Africa, there are about one healthcare worker for every 72,000 people. In the United States, it's more like one per 2,000. If 20% of all the deaths are healthcare workers, you can see the impact. They're just, we're, they're basically causing healthcare workers to become extinct in Western Africa. If we look at what's going on in West Africa, why did the outbreak start here? And we have to point to the idea that there is a stagnant economy in Western Africa. Poverty drives the people into the forest where they deforest. This is Sierra Leone. When they deforest the property, the bats, the animals have to move. They move to places where more people are. This increases since they're the ones who carry the vectors of the disease they're moving them into more populated areas. The infected person then comes to a healthcare facility. The facility has no personal protective equipment and so they're almost obligated in, to become infected. Once they're infected, as I said, they return home and infect their family. On September 12th, this paper was published in Science Express and it taught us something very important about this particular outbreak. First, there, as we look over time from January to June, uh, these peaks actually describe the diversity of the genome of the virus. And that on the left is the peak of the virus that was initially in the outbreak, but that as we looked later in May, it's actually a different virus. This speaks to uh, one of two things. Was it two sequential outbreaks that are coincident or as the virus moved through the population, did a new form adapt and actually become a distinct virus? What is clear is on the right here, if we look at all the Ebola outbreaks of all time, you can see that the rate of mutation, which is substitutions uh, site per year, is a, is a distribution like this. The, uh, the outbreak we're experiencing now is a very, very different distribution. Uh, put in more simple terms, the virus is more prone to mutate than we had seen in all Ebola outbreaks uh, until now. And that we find in a virus that has about 19,700 bases of information that we have uh, within this sequencing study, 395 mutations which are adapted. 50 of them are non-synonymous, which means that they are mutations that the amino acid that's encoded remains the same. But eight are non-synonymous, I'm sorry, non-synonymous <laughs> uh, non in very highly conserved sites. So non-synonymous means that the amino acid sequence actually changed. That's important if you're trying to make a vaccine to a virus because if you change the amino acid sequence, you change the antigenic potential for the products of the virus. So in uh, September 17th, the Centers for Disease Control said it's time to prepare for Ebola. This was their announcement. It says it may be coming our way. And uh, Wall Street Journal on the same day talked about a uh, warning for an unprecedented, uh, an unprepared America. And they concluded that, that the failure thus far to confront Ebola was broken down into three areas. One was engaging the true scope of the outbreak, which I think we've observed that uh, firsthand. The second was deploying therapeutics that might combat it. 
And the third was delivering medical equipment and personnel for the treatment. So there are numerous funding opportunities. And one problem is that federal grants are awarded to offset the direct costs for companies to make drugs for Ebola. But that these BioShield grants are used by some small te biotech companies to offset costs of existing programs, which is a bit um, a way of saying that they divert the money from what it's intended to do to do things that they want to do themselves. But on September 16th, the United States responded to address all those pieces. We sent 3,000 military people, which I believe now has been escalated to 6,000 people to West Africa to build uh, 10 1,700 uh, beds, which will be distributed over 10 centers, uh, train 500 healthcare workers a week so that they can address the outbreak, uh, $75 million from USAID for medical equipment, half a billion dollars from the Pentagon, and 400,000 treatment kits and sanitation kits. So we did the right thing there. Just September 16th was kind of a long time to wait. So right after this, September 16th, I think it's kind of ironic, but on September 24th, uh, Business Week, the title was How the U.S. Screwed Up the Fight Against Ebola. <laughs> so it's a little, I find it a little humorous. Um, <laughs> so, but you have to ask, well, why were they saying that? And, and having worked with these agencies, um, there's a committee, the Public Health Emergency Medical Countermeasures M Enterprise, known as FEMC, and FEMC answers to many different masters. It, ma it has to comply with the Department of Defense. It has to deal with the Department of Veterans Affairs, the USDA, Department of Homeland Security. It feeds into the Department of Health and Human Services, which then interacts with National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, Centers for Disease Control, BARDA, and the FDA. My message here is this is too complicated. This is too much bureaucracy if we want to fight a virus on the terms of the virus, we're going to have to streamline this process. Well, if we think about this outbreak on more personal terms, um, I broke out three things I think are worth noting. One, um, in Africa, women are the main caregivers in the family. And right now, 75% of uh, Ebola deaths are in women. So the most vulnerable, the most important people in that society are the ones that are dying. Second, the, uh, the, the problem is that having Ebola carries a stigma, and that is preventing trade and transportation. This means that uh, food security and nutrition are becoming problems. One, people can't work in the fields and harvest and collect the foods and bring them into the markets, and they can't sell them. Two, people who do grow things outside the area can't ship them in to be distributed. It has an effect of scarcity, which brings up the fact that these people already spend 50 to 70 percent of their income on food. If you drive the price of food up, you will cause a famine. Third, people in uh, Liberia, this was a story from uh, National Public Radio, that, that uh, before Ebola, 97% of babies were getting vaccinations uh, for things like measles. <clears throat> now the figure is 27%. So we're not vaccinating. The infrastructure, the healthcare infrastructure is damaged. And just to give you some perspective, in 1990, the world had 630,000 deaths from measles. A lot of people don't really realize measles is a lethal viral infection. But because of this high rate of vaccination, we reduced uh, from 1990 from 630,000 deaths to 158,000 in, in 2011. And that's a worldwide figure. This figure is actually down from almost 3 million per year that were in the late 70s. So vaccination was very powerful in protecting the lives particularly of children. And now they're not being vaccinated because of the infrastructure is lost. Now I want to talk about drugs. <laughs> we'll take the last 15 minutes to talk about the drug part of this. So the first problem we face is that the annual cost, or the, the cost to create an antiviral drug, or any drug for that matter, as a collective, uh, round numbers are a billion dollars in 10 years. 
So if you're going to make a new drug, you better have some time and some money. And it turns out that this isn't a very sustainable business model because a company can't make money over a billion dollars on something to treat that only pops up once in a while and only hits a few thousand people. Um, also, just notice one of the reasons why that cost is so high that the way we discover drugs is that we create, uh, we might look at seven million compounds to find candidates that could go into these various uh, funnel of pre preclinical pharmacology, safety, etc., leading to one or two products. So there's a tremendous rate of attrition when drugs go through the drug development process. And this is where the time comes from. But I want you to think, if we could prioritize antivirals, and there have been about 150 emerging infectious diseases since 1960, if we were to develop a therapeutic, a vaccine, and a passive immunotherapy for each of those, that would be 450 drugs at a billion dollars, we're talking about a half a trillion dollars, for something that there's really minimal return for. The second part of this is <laughs> that for emerging infectious diseases, the Department of Defense has strategic interests in some, and Health and Human Services has interest in some. One thing you have to keep in mind is that the federal government is constructed, and in fact, tomorrow there's a vote where judges who are in the legislative branch of the government, we're asking permission to allow them to be paid from another branch of the federal government. That is not a constitutional allowance right now. So if you have money in the Department of Defense, that's a federal line item. That line item doesn't work on things that are paid for in a different line item, such as health and human services. So when there are common interests, they break them apart based on how they would deliver the therapy. And in this case, the, the non-commercial funds are available, but essentially the government officials that help you get the money have never really developed a drug. They really don't know how to work with the FDA. It would be a conflict of interest. The last piece <laughs> is that as people try to develop drugs down here, you can find money from the National Institutes of Health. Health and Human Services has some early money. Uh, in the Department of Defense, you can go to the, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Uh, there's one called MIDRIP, DARPA. Uh, but what you see is they all stop here, as does NIH funding here, right at preclinical development. So what you have to do is you have to have enough data to convince people on this side of the funding to pick it up. And that's a challenging thing to do. And currently, it's considered a developmental support gap referred to as the valley of death. So as uh, my friend Dennis Ruby would told me once, if you're going to develop these kinds of drugs, you know, it's not for the faint of heart. The FDA did create <clears throat> a special way to approve drugs, and it's called the animal rule, and it was enacted because of the 9-11 attacks. They felt that for medical countermeasures, we should have a way to get a drug approved so we could use an ethical medicine to treat people, even though it's a disease we don't have in the United States. And they just have four simple elements that you need to satisfy. You need to understand how toxic your drug is. You need to understand that the model that you choose, you're using an animal model to replace humans in the phase three study. So the animal you choose should mimic what happens in humans the uh, endpoint should be very important, like death. And finally, you should be able to calculate what's the effective human dose. How do you know how much to give, how often, et cetera? So these are straightforward, but the FDA doesn't really want companies to use this as an end around for approval, because this looks easy, but it looks too easy. So now the FDA has a bit of a concern about that, and they kind of slow things down a bit. Well, let's just shift gears and say, if you were going to develop a drug <laughs> for Ebola virus, um, how would you do it? As it turns out, I, I tried to simplify this. Certainly, the virus is outside the cell. It has to get inside the cell. And then once, in, uh, once the virus is in the bloodstream, antibodies can find it and could, could block it. So there are what we would call passive immunotherapy, which you would retrieve from the blood. Um, this plus something like ZMAP, which are contrived monoclonal antibodies, these work outside the cell. 
and they'll clear the virus that's outside the cell, but the virus is actively dividing inside the cell. And so for the inside the cell, a number of drugs, uh, this one from Fujifilm, the one from uh, Sarepta, Tecmira, uh, uh, I can't remember that one right now, and, and this is, uh, uh, these are nucleoside analogs, we'll talk about them in a second, but they attack inside. So essentially, if you capture the virus inside the cell and outside the cell, you should have a pretty good uh, collective, you know, you've covered all the bases. So if we were to compare these approaches for a therapy, we can talk about an RNA-based drug like the AVI-7537 or the Tecmira compounds, passive immunotherapy, which we all have heard of, ZMAP, and a vaccine, which you've heard of. It's called the, the chimpanzee adenovirus 3 vaccine. This is the one produced by Glaxo. And I think this is a complicated slide, but I think that perhaps it's worth just looking at the bottom here, that we have strengths and weaknesses. So each therapeutic approach, strengths and weaknesses. The strengths of an RNA-based strategy is that it's a very durable response. Once you've blocked it, you've actually become immune uh, to, the vac to the virus for, for the rest of time. Uh, the strength for these are that they're easier to manufacture. Uh, ZMAP is grown in tobacco plants, for example, and the chimpanzee adenovirus is easy to manufacture in a fermenter. The weaknesses for RNA-based therapeutics is that they're complicated to manufacture. It's relatively expensive. Uh, the weakness for passive immunotherapy are resistance, uh, durable responses to the vaccine, and in the case of ZMAP, we've already observed <coughs> anaphylaxis, which is a very difficult thing to uh, see in patients who are already very ill. So let's just look. We have a lot of compounds that are in development. Uh, vaccines, for example, here's a list of vaccines. This is not a comprehensive list. And so I think the first thing that might come to your mind is you think, wow, we have all these problems. It's not a very good business idea. It doesn't make any money. It's really challenging to get things through the FDA and you have this valley of death. But there's like 40 companies developing these things. So it's still a climate is there to develop. Um, Probably the status would be the most important consideration here because we have an outbreak. It's important that we find something that's ready to go now. Um, and so the chimpanzee adenovirus vector is a partnership uh, between three entities, GlaxoSmithKline, National Institutes, um, and that is now finished phase one studies in non-human primates. They observed 100% protection, so this is a very good vaccine. Um, the other one is the um, VSV. It's a, a viral vector that carries the GP protein. And uh, that had 100% protection also in non-human primates. And they have an IND and will soon be developing uh, their, their vaccine. The rest are very interesting insights to where technology is leading. These are cutting edge ideas using a nucleic acid synthetic messenger RNA to inject directly into a cell so that it makes viral proteins is very charming and very new. These are the data from the GlaxoSmithKline um, chimpanzee vaccine, and it points to a problem, actually. Uh, first of all, uh, Tony Fauci would be the first to say, the idea of a vaccine isn't therapeutic. The idea of the vaccine is to catch people well before they become exposed to the virus. So you've got to have a week or two prior to their exposure to vaccinate. So. Uh, but the, this, they chose an adenovirus from a chimpanzee because they needed to do animal studies in rhesus macaques. So they needed a different adenovirus that didn't overlap. And they needed one different from humans so that there would be an immune response to the virus. So the chimpanzee was a good choice. But here under prime boost, I just want to show you some data. If you just give a single, uh, single dose of the chimpanzee uh, virus, the protection isn't at all good. But if you boost, you can actually improve that a little. Um, but what they actually found was that if you combine that with a measles virus from Ankara, MVA, so you use one viral vector to prime and a different viral vector to boost, you can get remarkably good data. The complication is, is that you now have two different products to make under these GMP regulations and regulatory development. Um, but obviously it's working, and there are 15,000 doses that will be available for phase two studies in Africa in December. 
And it is believed that they will produce as many as 230,000 doses per month uh, early in the year next year. So the idea that we could start to vaccinate the world is actually quite an optimistic story. I think we can save why the order has to be this way for a more detailed discussion at another time. What about therapeutics? Uh, I mentioned a few. I'll talk a little bit about AVI 7537, which is completed phase one studies. Um, the other one that was a dedicated uh, drug for Ebola was ZMAP, monoclonal antibodies. It's in preclinical development. The third is Tecmira's Ebola drug, which is also in phase one, um, but it's on clinical hold. There are this uh, favipavir was a drug developed for flu that they think might have some activity against Ebola. And the other one is brinsodofovir, which is developed for cytomegalovirus, which is a DNA virus. It's a nucleoside analog. So it's a little confusing that a analog that would block a DNA polymerase should be also able to block an RNA polymerase. But there are some data to suggest this is a good idea, but there are no data in an appropriate model. Um, BCX4430 is an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase inhibitor, and it does have very good activity, and they have filed an IND, so that's coming along. So, as you noticed, there are two drugs in this later stage that are RNA-based, so I thought I would just show you what does that actually mean. And then on the left here, you can see I'm trying to dis depict a messenger RNA molecule. It has this translation start code called the AUG start site. And the ribosome scans to find that AUG start site. Once it does, it assembles the ribosome. And it can start to make proteins. In the case of the virus, these proteins are viral proteins. They steal the cell's machinery to make the virus protein. The strategy of the RNA therapeutic is that you can use this recognition of sequence to bind at this site. Once bound, this scanning function is sort of blocking the ability to assemble so you don't make that protein. So it's specific for the protein that you target. And uh, both Tecmira and AVI, or Sarepta, chose the same uh, viral target, the VP24 target. And I thought it would be worth showing you how that works. So normally in a cell where there's no infection, we have this nuclear localization and its cargo, this green thing with the tail, that uh, can get into the nucleus, but it really doesn't do anything. This is the cytoplasm side, this is the nucleus side, and this is a pore that allows things into the nucleus. If you become uh, in some way an infection or some other event, uh, it stimulates interferon, which is an immune response. The interferon actually activates a gene called STAT1. That's these two funny looking triangles. And they bind to this complex that carries STAT1 into the nucleus. And STAT1 sort of translates interferon stimulated genes, a collection of genes all involved in immune responses. But in the case of an Ebola infection, this red ball, the uh, VP24, binds to the same place that STAT1 binds. <coughs> And instead of carrying STAT1 in to stimulate these genes, the VP24 blocks it, and all it does is carry in VP24. That doesn't result in the immune response. So essentially, it blocks the host's ability to respond. This is just to give you some insight into the currency of what we do here. Uh, so these boxes are the different genes in the Ebola virus. As I said, there were seven of them. And this is where the VP24 is and the translation start site uh, can be bound by this molecule. Uh, there's the AUG and the antisense orientation. And it, the chemistry of this looks like this. So every base that doesn't have a little plus looks like this. The ones that have the little plus look like this. And AVI 7537 has gone through five non-human primate studies where we've seen uh, anywhere from 60 to 100% survival. Uh, the 100% is actually a re-challenge study where the monkeys were treated, allowed two months, and then reinfected, and they will not be reinfected. But otherwise, it's about 80% is about as good as it gets. And we recently published, actually just last week, 
uh, paper in antimicrobial agents and chemotherapy on the phase one study for this compound. So here's 7537. In humans, these are the pharmacokinetic profiles for a dose ascending study, and that the uh, treatment emergent adverse events, or TEAE, uh, involved headache, uh, nausea, sinus congestion. None of those were dose dependent. Most of those are things you find in the placebo group, so quite safe. So if we look at this uh, collection of Ebola-specific therapies, and again, these arrows represent those seven genes. And in fact, uh, they also speak to the fact that actually there might be 10 genes. The GP gets doubled up, and they make several products from that glycoprotein coat. These little dashes up here are the sequencing information where mutations occur. And you can see that there's a cluster that occurs in the GP gene. Now, this isn't uh, surprising because that's what the immune system recognizes. And one way the virus could continue to survive is to evade immune detection. And so they would acquire mutations under selection pressure in the GP region. If you look here, VP35 has an RNAi from Tecmira. Um, uh, VP24 has an RNAi from Tecmira, and the L gene has this RNAi. And the AVI7537 is here at VP24, right at the very beginning. And the ZMAP3 antibodies are indicated here, and they're right in that GP region. If we sequence monkeys who've been exposed to these agents to a depth of 30,000 or more, so that at each position we determine the nucleic acid sequence of the virus to a depth of 30,000. We find some emerging mutations. Um, in the VP35, we have two mutations which uh, are targeted by the VP35 of the Tecmira compound. There are three mutations that will inactivate the monoclonal antibody from ZMAP, the 13C6. And a mutation in L is in the binding site for the other Tecmira component. Surprisingly, no mutations have been acquired in the target site for AVI 75. 37. So one other thing that happened was we looked for retasking drugs. So these groups looked at every drug that the FDA has approved and said, how well do they work against Ebola? And they came up with a fairly short list, but some surprises. Uh, two of them are anti-malarials. One that we know of, uh, probably everyone has heard of chloroquine. Chloroquine actually does a very good job. Uh, and 90 milligrams per kilogram protected about 80% of the mice that were infected. So that's actually quite surprising, but kind of a high dose. Uh, the other one that, to me at least, was surprising were these compounds here. These are estrogens. Uh, in fact, this is birth control, toramiphene. So uh, if you hear on the news that they're asking women to take birth control uh, when they are in, in regions that are subject, it's because they actually might work to block the virus. Um, I'm just going to finish with a couple of comments. Um, over the time at AVI and Sarepta, we looked at a lot of different viruses and were asked actually to respond in a rapid form against infection. And the, this RNA-based technology kind of lends itself to this. So you identify the target sequence, you design some candidate oligomers, and you manufacture them and go forward. I think the punchline is, is that, for example, we did have uh, such an example with West Nile virus. We went from concept to treatment of penguins in seven days, which led to an IND. Uh, Ebola, concept to delivery of a drug in seven days. Pandemic flu, uh, concept to a compound in seven days. Uh, dengue, it took 10 days. And uh, Acinetobacter took a little longer. And we really never had a chance to use that one. So this brings me to the, to the final punchline of would an RNA therapeutic be a good idea? Um, I actually believe this is the vision of future medicine, is that this virus infects perhaps a soldier who's in a place where we don't normally uh, find ourselves, and there are emerging infectious diseases that he would be exposed to that he might not have any immunity to. Um, step one would be to recognize the problem. And in a couple of these exercises, we found that that takes about one to four days. The guy shows up in the hospital, and they say, I don't know what this guy has. So, but what they do now, and they use modern technology, is that they take a blood sample from that person, 
and they send it to laboratories who do uh, rapid sequence analysis. And in these exercises, we found that we could sequence everything. That is, all of the transcriptome, every gene the human has, every infectious sequence can all be determined in 18 hours. If you could annotate that sequence, which can be done, again, in a computer, that could take anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours or to satisfy everybody several years. Um, <laughs> I'm glad somebody got that. Uh, <laughs> so the next step would be, can you pick a sequence for this? And I think this could be developed in silico where a program could actually just pick. This is the gene we want. This is the, the target region. This is going to give us this percent probability of success. It goes to the synthesizer. It would be great if you could complete that synthesis in about an hour and a half, do a quick purification, back to the patient within 24 hours of this. That would be the vision. This is absolute personalized medicine. Um, if you could do it for a virus someday, all you have to do is change the parameters. Couldn't you do it for someone with cancer or diabetes or you know, any, any disease because the currency here is actually fairly universal. So I, I want to conclude with the idea uh, from this, this uh, slide that came from YouTube. Essentially every little dot here is a plane. And uh, this is just looking at one particular time of day, but um, we live in a modern age where you can get from any one place to another place within hours. And from an emerging infectious disease point of view, you're, you're only hours from home. So it make you think a little bit more about um, infectious diseases. So I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you for being polite. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so, yeah, part of it was the idea that if you use a passive immunotherapy, um, you, you actually suppress the production of antibodies that the host makes. So once you've taken away the, the transient therapy, you know, you get what you get. The, the thing that I was excited about is that the RNA therapies, they slow the virus down such that the host's immune system can catch up. And, and in the immune system world, danger is, is a concept that they talk about that the more robust immune response is created from this danger. And that if, if you block a virus when that signal has occurred, that immune response will be very, very robust and very durable. You could probably come back 10 years later, challenge a patient, you'd still have immune response. This may not be true, certainly not true for the chimp adenoviral vector, and probably not true for the passive immunotherapy. But we'll see. <laughs> sure. I think it does have an effect on, so if you couldn't hear the question she's asking, does the fact that Africa is a warm, moist place uh, make it more likely for this outbreak to sustain itself? And I think the answer probably is yes. Um, it's not to say that it can't be tr transmitted to here. Obviously, it was in the hospital in, in Dallas. But the, the uh, possibility for a particle to uh, you know, leave your body and land on a surface and stay there for a while probably depends a little bit on how the humidity might keep that from drying out really fast, things like that. So it probably does make a difference. Right, right. I think, well, I think, I mean, I, I know people have thought of that and they've thought of sort of clever ways where the bats might actually vaccinate neighboring bats. Um, that would be a really good idea. 
and I think the cost is reasonable, and that might actually help solve the great ape problem, which I think we're all kind of in the background. We're still worried about that. Um, and I think maybe the challenge here is really, would that be sufficient to give you sort of the, the comfort that you seek? I think it's worth noting uh, bats in the Philippines carry an Ebola restin virus. There's never been an outbreak there. Uh, there are bats in Spain carrying the Bundabugio virus. I just like saying Bundabugio, uh, but they do, they do carry that, and there haven't been any outbreaks of, of Bundabugio in Spain. So, so while I, I, I think your idea is a good one, and I know people are finding it an attractive idea, I think they're feeling that it's not uh, comfort enough for them to deploy that measure just yet. You had a question. Um, well, the, the, uh, a couple of the compounds I talked about, the, the BCX4430 is an adenosine analog that was designed to attack RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. The, um, when we think of like a DNA polymerase, usually the substrate specificity, the structures are fairly conserved, but in RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, um, each virus actually has a pretty different version of that enzyme. For example, hepatitis C virus, it seems to have a preference that it can replicate a strand that it's attached to, but it won't easily find another RNA to replicate. So, so they each come with their own nuances. Um, they're fairly diverse, but obviously uh, BCX4430 looks pretty good against a number of RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. Um, it's a different kind of variability. It's not just the mutation frequency. It's just that each virus has its own, its own RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And some of them are actually quite small, you know, 17,000 Daltons. Some of them are actually pretty large, you know, sort of 40,000. Some of them are dimers. Some of them are monomers. It's actually, I mean, the active site has to be pretty similar in order for them to carry this out. That's what I think BCX was based on. And uh, hopefully more people will take that to heart. There'll be more drugs like BCX. Yeah. So you mentioned there's a mic that has to be based at that kind of higher rate of sound and kind of the activity. Um, is there a potential way to bypass that, go that route, route similar to being a farm country with similar mistakes to that? Right. With uh, no, no, no names and stuff like that. Right, right. Yeah, I think you, you sort of bring up an important big topic, actually. For example, the, the, the Tecmira approach is an RNA molecule, an, an miRNA or an siRNA. Um, and we know that the virus, actually, in addition to interfering with VP24, it actually binds to molecules like RIG-I. And RIG-I is a signaling pathway, as is the siRNA, which they haven't been able to evade the ability to stimulate RIG-I. So the, the uh, nucleic acid sensing system um, certainly is, is, a, is a pathway, but it's also exploited by the virus. And I think the, my biggest concern about the, for example, the idea of using a CPG motif, uh, which is an immune stimulatory motif, the problem with most of these ideas is that th there's sort of a zen character to them. While they do some things that you really want, they do other things you really don't want, you can't separate them. You get the whole package, and you get sort of this counterbalancing good and bad operating at the same time. But I think we did it. <laughs>